Hello and welcome to the webinar. We will be beginning shortly. I'm going to take a, a moment just to let everybody to or let everybody get into the room. But I want to give a few um, opening remarks. Um, due to high demand, we have added three new um, classes for the Assessing Ventilation for COVID-19 Mitigation, a hybrid online and in-person class that is uh, hands-on, where learners will get the chance to use bolometers to collect and analyze ventilation data with David Moore, CIH, from UC Berkeley. For more, visit coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. In an effort to continuously improve our course offerings, we've partnered with education and research centers around the country to solicit feedback on educational needs. This survey is intended for employers, um, HR personnel, and anyone responsible for determining what continuing education and trainings are offered to employees. I'm going to pop the link in the chat if you're interested in taking this uh, survey, we would really appreciate it. Okay, it seems like most people have been in, so welcome. On behalf of the Center for Occupational Environmental Health, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar, COVID-19 Wastewater Monitoring, Tracking SARS-CoV-2 Infection dy Dynamics Through Genome Sequencing. Thank you for joining us. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box in lieu of the chat. Uh, it allows us to kind of keep um, track of everything and we can, we can read them to the presenters at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the COEHCE YouTube page and on our website. All participants who logged in with a registration email for the full live presentation today will receive, a, um, via Zoom, will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and an evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate worth one continuing education hour. Once the evaluation is complete, you'll be able to access and print your certificate or save it. So at this time, I'd like to present our guest today. We have Rob Knight, PhD. Rob is the director of the Center for Microbiome Innovation at UC San Diego, where he's a professor of pediatrics, bioengineering, and computer science and engineering. He co-founded the Earth Microbiome Project and the American Gut Project, which is among the largest crowdfunded science projects of any kind to date. He has spoken at TED Talks, written three books and over 700 scientific articles. And in 2017, he won the Mastery Prize, often considered a predictor of the Nobel. He was honored with a 2019 NIH Director's Pioneer Award for his microbiome research. His work combines microbiology, DNA sequencing, ecology, and computer science to understand the vast numbers of microbes that inhabit our bodies and our planet. Our second guest today is Smirthy Kartikayan, um, PhD. Um, Dr. Kartikayan obtained her master's in earth and environmental engineering in 2014 from Columbia University in New York and a PhD in environmental engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology, specializing in environmental micro microbial genomics, working at the interface of microbial ecology, com computational biology, and engineering. Smurthy's interest, uh, sorry, Smurthy is interested in using multiomics approach to provide a holistic view of environmental systems. As a part of her postdoctoral research at Rob Knight's lab in UC San Diego, She's developing integrated wet lab and computational biology-based techniques to study how environmental systems could serve as markers for health and disease. Currently, she is working on developing high throughput approach for monitoring SARS-CoV-2 signatures and wastewater at the campus and county level. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll go ahead and let you take it from here. Thanks, Jess. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here today. Um, as I just mentioned, I'm Smriti, I'm a postdoc in Rob Knight's lab. And um, today I'm gonna go over the efforts um, we at UCSD, along with our wonderful collaborators, were able to um, achieve in enabling a high throughput system for wastewater-based surveillance of SARS-CoV-2. Um, to start out, I just wanna give an introduction on what we do as a part of our wastewater surveillance. So um, wastewater has been already shown to be a good indicator of infection dynamics in um, the county level, mainly because a lot of people who are 
asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and don't think they need to get tested could, could still be infected and actively spreading infection. So in a way, wastewater does provide a more balanced or unbiased view of infection dynamics because there are a lot of barriers um, people experience in certain communities to get access to testing, but wastewater is relatively agnostic that way. So in order to capture the actual dynamics it, at the campus level and at the county level, we implemented the wastewater surveillance system um, as follows. So we do building level wastewater monitoring on the UCSC campus. And we started this program about November of last year. So it's been exactly a year. We've processed about 25,000 uh, samples to date from our campus. So we also do the same um, along with the San Diego County by offering free testing as well as wastewater monitoring, as well as wastewater monitoring in the San Diego school districts. And we've processed about 2000 samples from there. And we also do this um, at the larger scale for the main wastewater treatment plant for San Diego County, which is the Point Loma wastewater treatment plant. It covers a relatively large catchment area of about um, two to two and a half million residents in the greater San Diego County. So the reason we first started this was, as you can see, um, San Diego County had a bunch of surges. So we started um, sampling at the Point Loma wastewater treatment plant somewhere about June or July when we thought we were going to be seeing a peak and that we thought that was probably the peak, but we were wrong. And at the same time, uh, the testing rates were very low in San Diego County. So unless um, you were symptomatic or you were exposed to a known case, it was really hard to get access to testing. So at that point, we turn to our sewers to see if we can actually get an idea of how, um, how bad or how good the county is faring in terms of source code too. So this is basically where we started. And um, here, what you see is our Point Loma wastewater treatment plant. Um, it serves about 2.3 million residents. It's a pretty large wastewater treatment plant and it's pretty much the only wastewater treatment plant for the um, San Diego County. So we sample three days a week from there and we're still sampling from there. And the effluent just after treatment just gets into the ocean. So that was on the county level. On the campus level, UCSD has a program called Return to Learn where um, despite the pandemic, um, we still had about 10,000 residents uh, living on campus in UCSD on a daily basis. And um, we had a lot more working on campus as well through the pandemic um, to keep the operations going. However, um, testing regularly um, at such large volumes and frequently is just not feasible. So that's why UCSD looked towards um, using uh, wastewater at the building level. The reason we wanted to look at building level is because at the county, you know, one sample covers two and a half million residents. In UCSD, for instance, if there are 25,000 people on campus and you put one campus sampler, it's always gonna come up positive and you would be required to test every single person on campus, which again goes back to our old problem. So we were looking at um, seeing the feasibility of putting samplers at the building level so we could target where we tested in case we saw wastewater positive, thereby optimizing our resources. So most of the studies back then were still done at the county level. So at the county level, you're, you know, you're screening a very large catchment and you're bound to find a couple, um, uh, you know, you're going to find at least a couple of cases on a regular basis. However, we weren't sure how feasible the same thing would be if you do it at a building level. For instance, if, it, if there are 600 people in the building and there's one asymptomatic individual, what is the chance that we would be able to effectively catch this one individual in a building of 600? So we needed to make sure that this was actually possible before we started jumping in and putting samplers at all these buildings. As a good starting point, we put one auto sampler outside um, UCSD's uh, medical campus and the hospital where we knew exactly how many um, infected individuals were present um, at any given day. And then we were looking at the SARS-CoV-2 signatures in sewage on a daily basis. And we found that even when there was only one infected person in the building, we were still able to capture the signal effectively downstream in our wastewater sample. So this was essentially the basis of um, our program at UCSD. 
So what you see here is just an overview um, of the auto samplers on campus. So um, we have about 130 active wastewater auto samplers that collect 24 hour composites on a regular basis on the campus. We have near complete coverage of all the buildings on campus, about 350 buildings um, on the UCSD campus are covered by our wastewater surveillance programs. They're split. We have 72 covering only the residents. Four of them are in isolation dorms. Our isolation dorms are just buildings where people um, who test positive on campus can are moved or can live um, during their quarantine. And 58 of the samples are non-residential. So the residential samplers are collecting seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The non-residential samplers are programmed only to collect Monday through Friday because we don't really expect enough of people coming to campus on the weekends in the non-residence buildings. As of fall 2021, we have 18,000 students who are currently living in campus housing and all of these are covered by our wastewater program. So for those of you who are not familiar with UCSD's campus, it's pretty spread out and pretty large. And all of the orange blocks you see on this picture are basically um, UCSD campus buildings. And all of those um, yellow things that you see light up next to a building are just the wastewater auto sampler locations, which collect from the respective buildings that you see on campus. So this is just a snapshot that's showing um, the residence buildings and how they're distributed on campus. As you can see from the um, map, this is our campus sewer map. The black lines you see with the arrow pointing direction are the sewer flows. And as you see, our campus housing is also pretty spread apart and they're not very concentrated. So um, we have samplers covering pretty much all of the um, residences. The way we decided um, how many samplers go per building was mainly based on the building occupancy rates. For instance, if you see the AS069 on the top, that's a pretty large building. It's a single building, but that building has nearly 500 residents, so it gets its own sampler. If you see in the bottom, um, you will see one sampler for a cluster of buildings. That's because the occupancy um, in these buildings are lesser, so it made more sense to have one sampler covering multiple buildings. So if it indeed test positive, you wouldn't have to test an alarming amount of people and it's still manageable. So at least 150 um, uh, individuals will be covered by each of our wastewater samplers. So um, logistically, to not make this a nightmare, we split how our sample collection is done by routes. So we have about seven different routes and they are split by their geographic distribution. So we have one person covering every route in their golf carts, picking up all the samples in their route, and then they bring it back to our lab every day. And it takes roughly about an hour for one person to cover about 20, 25 samplers in a route. And this is done on a daily basis. So to make, to streamline the entire data um, as a process, as well as the sample collection, and to make sure that, you know, we don't have any mix up in our samples, we definitely don't want to freak out the wrong building saying their building was positive, when in reality, it was just because my handwriting was bad. We um, came up with a, uh, we came up with an app, which um, all of the field staff or anyone who's collecting samples can just easily pull up on their mobile device. Um, all of our samplers have a unique barcode, and that unique barcode is already pre-linked to the buildings that would drain into that particular manhole that this sampler picks up. And we have another barcode, which is unique as well, to every sample bottle. So every time someone picks up the sample, they will first scan the sample barcode, and then they will also scan the auto sampler barcode. So ideally, if it doesn't match, it'll, you, you will be able to easily see that you know, there was some switch. So this way we ensure that we keep, um, we keep the entire data process streamlined. And there are some other simple questions say, oh, is the sample being collected today? This is important because sometimes you have clogs, we don't have flows. So we wanna make sure that, um, you know, if you say negative, it's a true negative and it's not because the sampler failed to collect samples that day. And sometimes when we do have clogs, we do try to get a grab sample um, and, in that case, we indicate that because if it's a grab sample, it's, um, it's unlikely that it's as accurate as a composite sample. Um, so the volume of our samples being processed per day is pretty large. And the main reason um, 
uh, this is a big bottleneck is because if our turnaround time needs to be the same day, because if campus um, leadership is making decisions based on our wastewater data, we'd want to make sure that we get the data the same day. So in order to simplify the entire process, we automated most of the wastewater viral concentration, as well as the extraction and QPCR by using liquid handling robots. So in essence, we don't pre-filter any of our wastewater samples. The reason we don't do this is because, um, uh, just because of the sample heterogeneity. For instance, on campus, we are picking up samples very upstream. So if someone flushes, you are probably gonna see the sample be still semi-solid at least, and you can still have solid associated viruses in your sample. So we don't wanna filter or just take the um, supernatant. So in that case, we just homogenize our sample and put it um, right for processing. We add um, magnetic nanoparticles, which will preferentially stick to the viral particles. They are not specific to SARS-CoV-2, so they would pick up anything that's similar in structure. And then we use a kingfisher, which employs a magnetic head, which will pick up the magnetic particles, which are attached to the virus that we're interested in. And it'll leave behind all the junk, which is a lot in the case of a wastewater sample. So once that's done, it goes through our um, system for RNA extraction, as well as qPCR detection for the SARS-CoV-2 genes. So this is basically the overview of how our sample gets processed in our lab. We get all our samples in the morning and within five hours, we're able to process close to 150 to 200 samples, depending on the day's volume. And all our county samples go through the same process as well, which we also get on a regular basis. So once that's done, as you see, we use liquid handling robots for the um, QPCR step as well. So this way we have three targets for each uh, for each sample and we consider the sample to be positive, you get amplification in all three genes per sample. If not, we call it inconclusive and we run the sample again to make sure. And then um, this is the way our data is integrated in the back end. So what all this means is that a person goes to the manhole where the auto sampler is, scans in the sample, brings it to our lab for um, SARS-CoV-2 analysis. So in the back end, the buildings that drain into this manhole as well as the occupancy data are preloaded into, into our um, server. So every time we get a positive, it goes and links back to the correct building. So what, it'll, what you see on the top is basically um, individual samples, individual wastewater samples that get scanned in every day. So as you see, each one of them in the top plate map has a unique ID, which is pre-linked to a building. And then what you see in the bottom is how the data gets updated onto our Google Sheet. So each, as you see, each unique sampler ID is linked to a manhole ID, which is linked to a specific building. So if you see a green, it means that it was negative for SARS-CoV-2, if it's a red, it means that that building was positive on that day. The value inside just indicates the cycle threshold value, average cycle threshold value for that sample. If you see a negative two, it means that that day the sampler didn't pull or that sampler was turned off or was not active on that day. So what you saw in the previous slide essentially is uh, how we see the data, but the general public sees the data as how you see on the right which is basically just an interactive map of UCSD campus. So red just indicates that that building was positive for wastewater signal on that day. And a blue means that that particular day that that building did not contribute to a wastewater positive. And the gray just means that that day the sampler did not pick up. So um, any individual, it's a public facing dashboard. So any individual can just go click on a building and see if that building was a source of a signal or not. On the top, you can see the historic data for that particular building as well. So this is just another zoomed in version um, of a sampler. So if you see a blue, it means that day was negative, And then the next two days, it was positive, negative, negative, positive, positive. So it also gives um, the person an idea of how long the signal was there in their building. So the notification system works in a way as I've, as I've shown here. So only the buildings um, uh, that are a source of SARS-CoV-2 signal will get a notification. I mean, only the residents of the building with the identified positive will get a 
notification. And then the students or the residents of the building would be asked to undergo um, clinical testing. So they just go to one of the vending machines that's located in one of their um, dorms or one of their buildings, and they uh, do the nasal swab test by themselves. And then um, once they do that, they can just drop off the sample on the left, and then the sample gets processed by our CLIA labs, and we get the data within a day. And once a case is identified, they're mostly moved into isolation housing, and then the signal for that building is monitored closely to see if that individual after moving, um, the signal comes back to negative, which would indicate that there was a, potentially only one person infected in the building. If you continue to see a signal, then we send out a message again, because there is a chance that there's more than one individual in the building. So that is our campus aspect of it. So the other aspect is the a school program, which is called SASI, which is also done in conjunction with the San Diego um, County, as well as our collaborators in the School of Public Health and Dr. Fielding Miller, who heads the study. So here, um, during the pilot stage, about 15 um, school sites were selected based on their zip codes. And they were also chosen specifically where the testing rates were not matching up to the prevalence rates, as well as um, places that ranked high in the vulnerability index, according to um, the California Healthy Places Index. So when we first started, um, all of these schools were um, had wastewater samplers installed. And every day, the wastewater samples were collected and analyzed in our lab. In addition, surface monitoring of high touch surfaces was also carried out in order to see if you can um, localize the signal to a specific room or a classroom or an area. And in conjunction with that, um, all of the students and staff who consented were also um, allowed to take part in weekly diagnostic testing. During the pilot phase, we had weekly diagnostic testing um, done on a regular basis um, so we could validate our data. So this is something I forgot to mention in the earlier slide. So when we first started our wastewater uh, monitoring system as well, all of the students um, in who were residing on campus were mandated to undergo weekly asymptomatic testing irrespective of the wastewater signal status. This was mainly to validate our wastewater sensitivity in catching uh, infections. Um, it was mainly to see how, um, how efficiently can the wastewater um, detect a um, signal prior to, or at least in conjunction with a clinical or diagnostic testing. So the same thing was done at the school level as well. And um, as you can see, the um, testing uh, concent rates increased as the, the study progressed. And we started out with pre, um, some in some areas with low 20s and they reached well over 70 through our study. And on the right, you can see one of the samplers that one of the kids in one of the schools um, uh, personalized. And on the left, um, you can see how, um, how efficiently the environmental signal was able to match the uh, uh, positive diagnostic signal. So here we found that nearly 95% of the cases that we were detected in wastewater were, um, were correspond, sorry, correlated with a positive sample. And when used in conjunction with surface, we got about 93% of identified cases associated with either, uh, either one of the environmental surveillance techniques for schools, which had at least a 70% concentrate. Of course, the higher the concentrate, um, the more robust your interpretation of the wastewater signal is going to be. And a lot of these cases, as we've seen with on campus, um, we will see a wastewater signal and it'll just be one person contributing to the signal. So in cases like that, we know the wastewater um, detection is very sensitive and it really helps if you have a high, um, you know, um, high consent or testing rate to capture the infected individual. So now that I've spoken about what uh, potentially wastewater can do in terms of overall uh, surveillance, I'm now moving on to how we can use wastewater to track emerging variants or variants of concern, um, you, uh, much like our um, clinical genomic surveillance. So in order to do that, we would need to be able to get good enough um, genome sequences from our wastewater. So we started um, sequencing all our wastewater positives from our campus as well as county and uh, to see if we can screen for variants. So the plot you see on the right essentially shows how well our wastewater 
um, signal, correlate, positivity signal correlated with our diagnostic positivity signal on campus. They're split as residential um, and then on campus, off campus as well. So we do find a pretty good correlation of um, wastewater being a good indicator of how severe or how bad the cases are on campus. So what um, our next step was to sequence all our positives. And I think as most of you already know, sequencing from wastewater is an entirely difficult thing, mainly because wastewater is a complex mixture. And as with a lot of environmental samples, they have inhibitors, they have a lot of um, RNases, which cause severe fragmentation of your wastewater, um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So, that is in part a challenge, which gives low sequencing coverage. And if you have low sequencing coverage, it's hard to make um, more robust uh, interpretations from our wastewater data. So we feel that a combination of optimization and the con vital concentration protocols enabled us to get us get good coverage for almost all our wastewater samples, even with the ones which are potentially low viral load. Um, our uh, QC for minimum coverage was 75%, so we did not consider samples that didn't meet that threshold. And we miniaturized our sequencing as well, so it let us push about 1,500 wastewater samples in one NovaSeq run. And as you can see, we have a median coverage of over 96%, and mostly only high-quality sequences were used in any downstream analysis. So another thing with wastewater is, uh, like I mentioned, wastewater is basically aggregating um, waste um, from multiple different individuals. So if it's a clinical or a nasal swab, it's just one individual and it's a pretty straightforward process to analyze your genomic sequences. However, with wastewater, especially at the county level, you have, you have over like 2 million residents contributing to a signal, with potentially multiple different strains or lineages in circulation. So what this just shows is the viral diversity in wastewater is definitely higher than what we see for a nasal swab where we don't really expect much viral diversity at all. So currently, most of the lineage calling um, software like Pangolin um, expect only one lineage or one lineage to be present in your viral sample and the methods function accordingly. Unfortunately, for wastewater, that's not the case. So it's an advantage as well as not. It's an advantage because you can get one sample with so much information, but if we don't know how to interpret the information, it's basically useless. So our next step was to see how best to interpret multiple lineage data from a wastewater sample and how to validate this. So in order to do that, we made a bunch of different synthetic mixtures in our lab. Um, so in collaboration with our PSL3 lab, we got um, about five different um, lineages uh, from our clinical samples, which were A, lineage A, delta, gamma, beta, and alpha. And they were mixed in multiple, in different, in, sorry, in different abundances ranging all the way from 5% to 100%, which just means that, you know, um, the, um, alpha could be 5% in a sample, delta could be 10, gamma could be 25. So we tried a bunch of different combinations and we sequenced about 96 of these in triplicate. And then once these were sequenced, we analyzed, um, we, uh, we developed in collaboration with Christine Anderson's lab at Scripps, developed uh, a deconvolution tool to see how well can we um, bioinformatically separate these strains out. So in this case, we knew exactly what we put in. And the reason we did a synthetic mixture instead of doing in silico is because there are a lot of bias in sequencing artifacts that can arise, which um, an already sequenced sample is not exposed to. So that's why we did this. And as you see on the right, the tool essentially has a very good level of prediction. So um, we know how much we put in and the tool essentially says how much it expects to find in the same sample. So I am not going into the details of um, the tool at this moment, but it is a depth-weighted demixing algorithm. And it does, um, it does a good job of not only predicting what variants are present, but it can also pick up emerging or variants that have not been described yet. And this is the predictions, which are specific to every lineage that we put in our synthetic mix. And it does a pretty good job for all of the variants that we use in our testing. 
However, I should point out that these are all synthetic mixes from clinical samples. So while this is more of an ideal case scenario, we wanted to make sure that this translates to our wastewater data set as well. So in order to do that, we picked some of our wastewater samples, which we knew were mixes because they were from the county wastewater treatment plant or they were from isolation dorms. And then we ran a variant panel screening for the most common variants in all these um, in all of these lineages in the variants of concern. So what you see in the bottom are just the mutations and the variants that contain these specific mutation. So the, this is a qPCR based approach to see if we got amplification in any of these mutations. So we took the same samples that we knew were mixed, and then we ran a variant panel, and then we compared the sequencing results for the same samples using our deconvolution tool to see how well um, they matched. And we found a really high level of concordance, about 99% overall rate of agreement. We got one false negative, but we think that could have just been an artifact of our um, qPCR as well. So this was run for all of our mixed lineage samples, but I've only shown it for a subset to not make it overwhelming. So once we had a good system in place, we then moved on to see how well wastewater can, it can be used as a genomic surveillance tool at a smaller scale as well as a larger scale. So what you see here is a, a plot that shows um, the variants of concern that were circulating in San Diego as well as um, California during our time of sampling. So we started sampling November last year, and this just shows about nearly one year's worth of our sampling efforts. So what you see on the top are basically our each circle there on the top is a wastewater genomic sequence. The one in the bottom, which is black, are the ones we got from sequencing nasal swabs in the San Diego County. So we sequenced about, um, so this shows data from about 31,149 nasal swaps from the San Diego County during the same period of our wastewater sampling. And on top, you can see our wastewater um, results. So for Epsilon, unfortunately, we, by the time we started sampling for uh, wastewater, Epsilon was already a thing. However, if you see the curve on top, it does show that the wastewater is still showing us a good level of um, how, the um, peak is going to be. It's still pretty leading. And this is particularly important in a place like San Diego because San Diego County um, has a very high level of um, sequencing um, genomic um, clinical samples compared to the rest of the US. And despite that, we still were able to find the alpha, first instance of alpha as well as delta in the wastewater ahead of the county's um, clinical genomic surveillance. So this one, I think alpha was found two weeks before in our wastewater samples and not just one in multiple wastewater samples in um, November. And it was first detected in December in, um, in San Diego in, on camp, from a campus sample as well. The same thing with Delta. So this shows it on a larger scale. Now, if you just zoom into campus, we still see that even with campus, we do see a very good correlation between our wastewater genomic surveillance and our clinical genomic surveillance, where you do see the peak come ahead in wastewater. And so if you notice here, it's pretty close because during that time, there was a testing mandate that was existing at UCSD saying every week you have to test. So there's a higher chance that your um, lead time is compressed because you have more frequent testing. However, when you have less frequent testing, you can see the lag time is significantly increasing. So this is for our. Um, this is just for the three variants of concern that were um, that caused surges in San Diego. So now we're looking at the bigger picture of what are all the variants that are circulating in San Diego and how well can we use wastewater to um, get an idea. So the plot you see here um, just shows uh, both of these are for nasal swabs. On the left, you see the nasal swabs from our campus. RTL just means campus samples at UCSD. On the right, you see about 31,000 nasal swabs collected from San Diego County at the same time. Um, you can see pretty much all major variants. So the pink, the orange, and the teal are basically the three alpha, um, epsilon, and delta variants. So you can see delta sneak up somewhere right here in our nasal swabs um, from our campus samples. And it's also reflected in our San Diego County nasal swabs as well. So this is 
from our clinical surveillance. So next, we wanted to see how well does this compare to our wastewater surveillance. So the top two panels show the clinical surveillance, the bottom two show the wastewater for the same time period and the same area. So at the same time, when we looked for se genomic sequences in wastewater, we found a really good correlation on campus as well. So campus, um, UCSD campus sequences every one of their um, positives that they find in the nasal swabs. And we also do the same for wastewater. So as you can see here, you saw the sliver of Delta here and you see it here as well, but it pretty much exploded very quickly, but this change was not reflected in the nasal swabs till later and the same at the county level as well. And you can also see mu being picked up much earlier um, here in our wastewater and it only came up in our nasal swabs a little later, which also says that the tool can pick up emerging variants of concern, even though if it's not officially designated as one. So um, you can also see some trailing um, signal here. That's mainly because we think there's persistent viral shedding um, by people in their stool, which can outlast their nasal swab shedding as well. So moving on to the larger picture, you can see on the left, our vital load that we get from the county's main wastewater treatment plant at Point Loma, which is in blue. And the gray is their daily reported cases by San Diego County. And you can definitely see a Delta surge come up at least two weeks ahead in the wastewater compared to the um, case load recorded by the county. This is in part also because um, San Diego County has high vaccination rates and there's a lot, there's a chance that most of these cases were asymptomatic and did feel the need to test. On the right, you see the sequencing data for the same time period from Point Loma. So if you see a color, which is not gray, it means that that belongs to a Delta. And right from June, we see the sudden increase in Delta. Right now it's over 99%. And we're also able to get to such fine grain resolution as sublineages of Delta here as well. So um, in order to see how closely our uh, sequencing uh, match, matched, we took, like I mentioned, um, UCSD sequences all of the nasal swab positives as well. So what you see here is a phylogeny that's linking the wastewater sequences to the um, nasal swab sequences from our campus. So the gray is a nasal swab from campus. The blue is just a wastewater swab, wastewater genome sequence from campus. And a lot of times we found near or 100% matches from wastewater and nasal swab. And when we look at the metadata, it shows that it was the same individual who was in that building at the same time who then tested positive um, and then got their genome sequenced later. And this is also useful. Sometimes you'll see multiple instances of blues here, which means that they have persistent viral shedding. This is especially useful if someone um, tested positive, went to an isolation dorm, came back and was still shedding. We can still uh, match their genome sequences and say, oh, you know, it's probably the same person. And then um, this, uh, this is just a very close snapshot of the same um, same slide you saw before. For Delta, it's showing how closely we can find matching signals. And how um, it also tells us how long a person sheds before they go get tested, because sometimes we'll get the same genome sequences three days in a row. It's very likely that it was one person shedding um, before they went and got tested. So another cool thing about this is you can also see if you can detect outbreaks just by looking at the genomic, um, genomic signal. So if there's only one person in a building shedding, then it's very likely you will get a 100% match. If there are multiple people, then we have to use the um, deconvolution to see if there are multiple strains in wastewater. And this just, is, um, just shows an instance of how we can use um, the wastewater genomic sequence data in tandem with the clinical genomic sequence data to identify outbreaks. So here, as you can see, these are two closely located buildings which had wastewater monitoring. Uh, throughout the time period. We found exact matching sequences from these. And then once they were moved to the isolation dorm later, we could find the exact um, sequence there as soon as they moved in the wastewater sample there. So this is one of the many instances where we can observe multiple small linked outbreaks in buildings that were on campus close together. And the same thing is also applied for SASE. So in SASE, it's more of a real world scenario where you don't have 100% concentrate as you might for a campus. 
So here um, you can see that we did find a lot of matching samples from our wastewater to the um, clinical genomic sequences as well. And this is particularly useful when you have low concentrates. And if you do find um, if you do find a signal, it's pretty easy using wastewater to see that if it's just an outbreak, if it's a single strain, or if there are multiple. And with that, this is currently where where we're at. I want to take the same time to thank every one of our collaborators who made this happen. It was a huge um, team effort, and this was the reason why the whole um, project came together as well as it did. And with that, I am done with my presentation, and I would be happy to take any questions, and my PI Rob would also be happy to answer any related questions as well. Great, uh, thanks, Smithy. So, uh, one, wonderful job. And uh, as Smithy says, we're both uh, here and available to uh, answer any questions you have about this work. Hey, yes, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. And again, if you can put those questions in the Q and A box, I will start asking them now. So, um, let's see. First question. It's two parts. Um, so to be clear, the wastewater testing has earlier indicators as well as direct reflection to swabbing. Um, and the second part of that was, is there a differentiation between infection versus antibodies from vaccination? Uh, every, everything we showed you was from qPCR testing, not from serology. So uh, we don't we don't have matched serology data, although that would be very interesting for a follow up study. And uh, in fact, uh, on campus at uh, UC San Diego at the moment, uh, we're currently seeking uh, we're currently seeking approval for a uh, serology study looking at neutralizing antibodies that will uh, allow us to look at the campus population with that aspect as well. But so far, what you're seeing is based on qPCR testing. And um, and, and and yes, uh, that that understanding is correct that the uh, that the wastewater testing does give you an early indicator compared to uh, compared to uh, clinical qPCR, but uh, in addition, the results are concordant. It's not like we see completely different things in the wastewater. Uh, it's the same signal, only uh, time shifted slightly earlier for wastewater. And Smurthy, did you want to add anything? Okay. So the next question: um, You mentioned someone isolated, then returned, and we're still shedding. What was the isolation period and what were the corresponding nasal swab results, if you know? Um, I think, I don't know if Natasha is on the call, but she might be able to answer this question better because they track, um, uh, you know, the number of people who were in the building and if they go into isolation and come back. I think it's about 10 days, but I'm not sure what the 10 days to two weeks is my guess, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I, I do see Natasha on the call. So uh, Natasha, if you're able to come in, that would be very helpful. Yeah, um, Natasha, if you can actually raise your hand. Oh, 10 days, okay, that's perfect. Uh, 10 days isolation. I think normally sometimes when that happens, the signal is pretty intermittent. It's not a very strong, persistent signal that we see with an active infection. Thank you. Okay, next question. Could this technology slash method be used downstream of, let's say, a zoo or other um, to see if and when a variant might jump to an animal kingdom? That is an absolutely great idea, and we'd, uh, we'd love to do that if funding were available. Uh, we've been in discussions with the uh, San Diego Zoo and Safari Park, uh, which are two separate, uh, two separate facilities here about uh, various other uh, various other animal work, including um, including, for example, doing rapid response in the environment of the uh, of the gorillas that tested positive uh, some time ago. And uh, every everything that we've shown you here that applies to humans um, should be uh, very useful in uh, in zoo or wildlife settings as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Knight. Uh, the next question. When they were allowed to return from isolation, did they meet the CDC protocol of 10 days since positive, no fever, and improving symptoms? Uh, that's another Natasha question. Um, Natasha, any chance you could answer that one? Uh, yes. And um, Natasha, if you want, um, if you have any questions, if you raise your hand, I can actually allow you to speak that one at one if you want to. So it's up to you. Oh, there we go. Um, let's see. 
And okay, so the next question, what is the long-term plan to continue this testing? <laughs> I, I wish we knew. Um, I, I mean, it depends a lot on the course of the pandemic. Uh, everyone keeps hoping that the pandemic is, uh, is over this time and we can shut it down uh, every time there's a drop in cases. But uh, so far that hasn't been true. And, um, and uh, especially the uh, recent excitement about the uh, Omicron variant uh, suggests that we're going to be continuing this for some time. Uh, and um, I, I guess to forestall future questions in the chat, um, although we are looking for it, we haven't found it yet in, uh, in our campus community. Thank you. And again, if anyone has any more questions, we still have 15 minutes, so feel free to add them into that Q&A box. Um, the next question, is the virus in wastewater spread through fecal matter or urination or both? So far, they have not been able to find um, infectious virus from these. There's been only one study that found infectious virus from a stool sample, but so far, no, we don't think that's a mode of transmission, but I guess there's a lot more we need to do before confirming. But, but I think the question was also partly about, uh, is the signal in the wastewater coming from uh, coming from urine or from stool? Oh. And we, we, think, we think mostly it's coming from stool on the basis okay. of uh, qPCR studies that show um, high loads in stool, but uh, essentially low or zero loads in urine. So that's where we think it comes from. It also picks up from the sinks, so. But that's true, although uh, you'd, you'd think that the viral biomass from uh, any saliva mm -hmm. or uh, sneezes going into the sink is, um, you, you'd think yeah. to be less than what's coming in from the stool, but we don't really right. know. And uh, in, shall, shall we say that enthusiasm for doing controlled experiments of uh, flushing a defined amount of virus down a, uh, down a sink or toilet, um, enthusiasm for those types of experiments has been very low uh, from an approval standpoint. So uh, we don't have any direct data on that. Um, it would be a fascinating thing to follow up if anyone's at a facility where you think you might be able to get approval either for uh, having a subject with the defined uh, load of viruses defined by qPCR uh, using facilities in a way that you can measure uh, where you're sure that everyone else is negative or alternatively for controlled experiments where you, uh, where you flush a defined amount of virus um, uh, down, uh, down the toilet or sink. But to my knowledge, those types of experiments are hard to approve and haven't generally been done. Great, thank you. Um, the last question so far that we have, if anybody else has any, please put them in now or uh, ever hold your peace. But did you identify worker exposures at the water treatment plant associated to the exposure to the water streams containing the COVID um, virus variants? So, so far, um, any study that actually did um, infectivity from wastewater has not found them to be infectious. There are not enough studies, but the ones that did do it did not find any infectious viral particles that were from um, sewage or the environment. Thank you. And then let's see this last question. So uh, with all the bleach chemicals, disinfectants, et cetera, that go down the sewer, um, the viral load and its DNA are still quite telling. Um, I'm not really sure about the second part of the question, but I'm assuming that with um, the bleach chemicals and disinfectants, does that like compromise in some way, maybe some of your data? Um, that's a really good question. But if that were the case, we would have known by now when we do building level surveillance and we know exactly how many people in the building are infected or not. So um, if that were the case, and we're screening for RNA. So the virus RNA is pretty hardy. So I, if it was impacting our ability, we would have known by now. Yeah, but we I, do I, spike in controls too to make sure that you know there's something in the sample that's potentially not inhibiting uh, our recovery of the virus too. So we do run uh, controls to see if our controls amplify for the same sample, and we did a lot of spike in experiments as well. Yeah, and I, I think it is worth noting that we don't know anything about uh, whether any of the viruses we recover from wastewater are live or not. Uh, the only way to assess that is inside a BSL three facility. And um, these, these types of viability experiments are very difficult to do because uh, if anything else in the wastewater kills the cells, 
and there's all kinds of uh, there's all kinds of things in there that are cyt are cytotoxic to the extremely fragile mammalian tissue culture uh, that you have to do in order to culture live virus and do uh, do growth and replication assays. Um, that's a very challenging question to answer from an environmental sample. So uh, unfortunately, we don't know anything about uh, which of these viruses are still alive. Uh, let's see, Chad asked in the, in the chat, uh, was our predictive sequence uh, analysis algorithm able to predict the, uh, the Omicron variant earlier on? And um, I, I think we should clarify, we, we have been doing some spike in experiments on our bioinformatics pipeline. Uh, to verify that uh, if we get an Omicron sequence, we'll be able to detect it. Uh, but we have not we have not yet detected any for real uh, on campus at this point, although we're closely monitoring that situation. So uh, so basically we believe on, on, on the basis of taking the published sequence and uh, running the published sequence through uh, various stages of our pipeline as though we had really detected it. And that's mostly been taking place in, in CCBB at the moment. Um, we can we can for sure tell if we get a sequence like that and correctly classify it as Omicron, but um, but so far we haven't seen one for real. Thank you. And there is uh, one last uh, kind of question, which I can turn into a question, but um, just with regard to, to dealing with like wastewater and such, like what um, maybe what protocols do you have in place for privacy issues and um, and things like that that might come up? Yeah, so we did we did submit um, to the IRB uh, essentially uh, essentially a series of questions asking whether this was going to be categorized as human subjects research. Uh, they they determined that it was not human subjects research and uh, was was not going to be under their purview. So the types of approvals we have are more from the H and S facilities and so forth. Um, Right, right now, uh, there's no way to track any of this back to individual. Um, I think an interesting question that should be approached from an ethical perspective before it's uh, before it's approached from a technical perspective is um, suppose we were able to get to single stool resolution and uh, do sequencing either the DNA or the microbiome out of that individual stool sample to tell whose it was and then cross reference that with viral status or with chemical analysis of the wastewater. Uh, what types of uh, what types of permissions and approvals would be needed when the analysis reaches that level of resolution? And um, so far, uh, so far to my knowledge, uh, no one's really working on that question. Although you'd think it would be very interesting to approach from a, a bioethics and privacy perspective. Um, and it's entirely possible that people who are more involved in, in news, the national uh, wastewater uh, surveillance system, than I am. Um, have uh, already thought about a lot of those issues, uh, but um, as far as as far as I'm aware, there's no there's no report about how those how those issues should be handled at the point where they become technically possible. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And then, if anybody else has anything to add, I would love to um, hear any any final thoughts or anything before we go ahead and wrap up. Yeah, I should also uh, add before Natasha freaks out that we, we could not get that level of resolution with the existing equipment that we have deployed on campus. Um, it would require uh, it would require some sort of new technology beyond the robotic samples that we have currently. Um, but there are there are a number of technologies out there, uh, such as, um, for example, the nano robots that Joe Wang and our uh, Center for Wearable Sensors produces that uh, could be applied uh, could be applied to this kind of thing. Uh, right now they're cost prohibitive, but uh, as with any other nanotech, uh, the costs of those kinds of approaches are dropping precipitously. So the uh, the idea that you might be able to do individual stool analysis, say sometime in the next five to 10 years is not unreasonable. Thank you so much. And I just want to thank you also, Natasha, for, for jumping in. I know we've been really uh, happy to let too much, but thank you for your um, feedback as well. And uh, thanks for everybody for being here. We're going to send you out an email tomorrow that will have all of the information that you need, including the recording to this webinar. And if you have any questions or anything, feel free to email them uh, to coehce at berkeley.edu. And we can try to uh, forward those as necessary. Um, and we'll put everything that you might need into the website. So thank you again to our guests.
Uh, yes. And we have one last question that, that showed up in the chat uh, about are we aware of this, if this research is happening at other locations or if it's being duplicated elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're certainly we're certainly trying very hard to make it reproducible and, and um, to get it duplicated elsewhere. And uh, all of the protocols are open. All of the um, uh, all, all of the methods are, uh, are published now or will be soon. And if you're thinking up, uh, if you're thinking about setting up something similar, uh, we'd be delighted to help you set up with that. And uh, an important aspect of UCSD's return to learn program is uh, being able to disseminate what we're discovering here to the community broadly. And uh, that includes the methods to enable you to do it yourselves at your own sites. So uh, certainly get in touch if you're interested in doing that. And um, Dr. Knight and Dr. Um, Karthikeyan, if you have any um, maybe emails or websites that you would like me to put on the website, I can put those up there for them to be able to access quickly through the resources. So go ahead and email me that. And thank you again, everybody, for being here. Great. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to do this. And uh, yeah, uh, great questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.